Goedemorgen iedereen. Welkom op dit, uh, ja, voor sommigen misschien wat vroege uur. Nee, ik zie heel veel mensen zeggen, nou, het valt mee. Ik vond het wel vroeg om hier te komen, maar het ligt waarschijnlijk meer aan mij dan aan, je, uh, aan wat anders dan. Uh, welkom bij mijn talk, uh, Certificates and Encryption, all you wanted to know, but we're afraid to ask. Eerst even een klein stukje over mezelf. Uh, ik ben Pieter van der Meer, ik ben engineer uh, uh, bij Dataworks. Uh, no, should I do it in English? French? French? No, not in French. <laughs> no, I'm not going to do that in French, because my French is like uh, non-existent. So I'll start again. Uh, my name is Peter van der Meer. I'm an engineer at DataWorks, which is a small company in the Netherlands. Uh, we do data engineering and data science. Um, if I'm not working or doing anything with data or computers, um, you can find me on boats like that, just to have fun. Uh, don't start uh, sailing because it's quite an expensive hobby. You can, it's a lot cheaper to buy a computer every three years. Before we start, a little disclaimer. What I'm going to tell you here is very much simplified. Uh, and to be honest, I'm not a mathematician or a cryptographer. Uh, it's hard. The mod behind all the processes, if you really want to know how it works, uh, go to the bookstore, buy a piece, uh, a pack of paper, put it into your printer and print out about two or three uh, white papers and then you can start reading and once you have that, done that one, you understand the mod, probably, hopefully. Okay, next. Oh, this one is left blank. You will find out later on in the presentation why that is. The reason I started with this presentation uh, and thinking about it is because a lot of times people say, eh, certificates, it, it's hard, uh, I don't know how hard it works. Yes, the ops guys can do it. So everybody tends to forget about it or ignore it, so yeah, we can do that later on. And when you're lucky, there's somebody within your team that knows a little bit about certificates and everybody's like, you do it. I'm done with it, I don't want to know. Um, but it's actually quite challenging and fun when you start understanding you know, how it works and what you can do with it. Especially when you think about it later on. And, oh, yeah, yeah, it works like that, and you can do all kinds of things. Okay, a little bit of history about encryption in, in general. Uh, it started about 60 BC. Um, I think everybody that went to uh, lower school, middle school, that secret messages exchanging be between your friends? Who did that when they were kids? Quite a few, huh? What you probably did was a Caesar cipher. You just had the alphabet, you shifted and positions, and that way you uh, exchanged me messages. Um, that was all pen and paper that went on for, for quite a long time. There were a few variations on it, uh, World War I, there were a few other variations on it, but still mostly pen and paper. And the next step was actually uh, just before Second World War, then the Germans invented the uh, Enigma machine. And, but that was all mechanical based, it had rotors and you had to turn things and you had to really push things in so that a rotor would turn and then some kind of secret message uh, would come out. And this is how that thing uh, actually looks. This is one of the early versions. This one only has three dials in it, so that one was uh, cracked uh, early 43 by a few Polish guys. And the Germans figured that out and they added two more. So that was, uh, they didn't like that. And just in the and 60s, early 70s, they started going, oh, we can do encryptions, uh, encryption by means of computers. So they computerized the, the entire process. But that was just uh, late 60s, 70s. These are some key terms I'm going to use throughout the presentation, and bear with me, uh, they will, uh, I will explain them later on. Uh, a cipher which has two different spellings. I don't know why, it's probably English-US thingy-like. 
uh, but a cipher is actually an, a byte of characters that are encrypted. Then you have a key and the key size, that's the, the secret that you use to encrypt your data. Symmetric and asymmetric encryption. When you do symmetric encryption, you have one key and both parties know that single key. If you have asymmetric encryption, you both have a public and private part and you exchange the public part in the, for the encryption. But then still you have, uh, you can encrypt it correctly. There are quite a few implementations. I just name a few here that are yeah, probably known to most of you. Uh, RSA, anybody heard of it? Quite a few hands. DES, triple DES. It's just the same thing, but uh, an iteration on it. And ND5, which is actually not encryption, but uh, AAS, uh, Diffie-Hellman, uh, elliptic Diffie-Hellman. Oh, well, I'm quite impressed uh, by all of you. OK, first thing, uh, the RSA uh, algorithm. That was uh, published in 1977. Uh, they started working on it in 72, give or take. Uh, it was named uh, after in, 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 the mm, inventors. Uh, Ron Riffis, uh, Eddie Shamir, and uh, Leonard Edelman. And what they actually said, okay, how hard is it to factor out, the, the, to get the factors of a large multiplication back, especially when you're doing with uh, prime numbers? The only problem with it, it's fairly slow. It's slow to figure out how, what the original uh, was. But how does it work? Initially, you start by choosing two large prime numbers. And when I say a large prime number, if you go to a certificate uh, that you can find on the internet, the numbers are, I believe, uh, 196 characters long. So that's quite a large uh, prime number. The first thing you do, you, you calculate the product of, the, of, of the, these uh, numbers, and that is the first part of the public key. That is something you can share with anybody. We don't care, because you, if, if I uh, multiply two prime numbers, especially when they're big, and I say, okay, what were the original two numbers? It's almost impossible uh, to figure that one out. Then you calculate phi, which is uh, the, the prime numbers minus one multiple, 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 yee, um, it's early today. You multiply, okay, you take them together. Oh, man. Uh, and you choose a, a number, uh, E, that is co-prime. Anybody know what, what a co-prime is? Uh, not, neither did I, but I have to read it here because I keep forgetting it myself as well. Uh, this relative prime or co-prime are two positive integers are said to be relative prime if their greatest common divider is one. So actually you take the two numbers and you figure out what is the greatest number you can divide both of them with. That's actually what, what you're doing. That's a fairly special number. Fun part is when you go to a website and you take out the certificate, uh, and you take out the detail, you look at the details. Uh, one of the values that are in there is called the exponent, which is the E number, and in general that is 65,537. Pick any random site, this will be the number. I still haven't figured out why they always take that one. So I hope to, that I hope to find a real core CPU guy that can explain me why this is the reason, because I think it has something to do with that one, but with, with the calculations later on. Um, next thing, you do the modulo inverse, which is another trick to, to uh, calculate uh, the number, uh, and especially the modulo part is, is the one that makes it hard. Because everybody knows more modulo, you do the round robin when you uh, reach the uh, end of it, you start counting again, and it makes it even harder to, to uh, get the number back. So then you have uh, uh, three parts, the, the N, the E, you can share, and the D is, is, is the uh, inverse, you keep that one secret. 
This is just a quick example on how, to, uh, how it's actually done. And what you can see here, uh, we start out with two prime numbers, 61 and 53. You multiply them. You do that with the minus one multiplication. You find the co-prime, which is more or less the uh, common divider. The, uh, the uh, mod uh, of the phi, the model inverse, and then you have a public key and a private key. If you then have a character, which in this case, uh, what, what did I pick here? Uh, a is uh, 65. So you take 65 you, to the power of E, to 17, and you do the modulo of that part, and you get to 2,790. Okay, cool. If you send that one, it's very almost impossible for somebody to, to get the original number back. But if you have those numbers, it's fairly easy. Because you take that one, which is not a part, to the power, mod, modulus that one, and you get 65 back. That's all that's to it. But the hardest part is because the numbers are prime and large primes, and you have some modular calculations in it, it's nearly impossible to get the original answer back. And yes, it can be done. RSA, uh, if you take RSA and you take a key size of 128, you can crack that in about a week. But it, it's doable, but you need a lot of power for it. The next big invention in uh, encryption was Diffie-Hellman. They did this one already in 76. And they figured out a way to share a secret on a public channel. Because uh, public-private key encryption is fairly slow. If you have a single key, so uh, symmetric encryption can be done a lot faster. So you actually want to exchange a private key. But if I want to communicate with you, and I ha first have to go to, here, this is my private key. That will take a lot of time. You can send it by mail, but yeah, what happens then? So Diffie and Hellman, uh, they figured out uh, on how to do that so that you can share a secret. The simplest explanation I, I have found is this one, with the, uh, the famous color uh, example. You just start out with two colors, randomly chosen, in this, uh, in this case, uh, yellow. And Alice and Bob both add their secret color to it. Could be anything but just their secret color. They mix it. They send that one, that part, over the line. When it's received on the other end, they mix their own color again with it. And look, it's the same. So you send the yellow over the line. Oh, sorry, uh, the, the, sorry the, the, the mixed colors, you send it over the line, and like, yeah, sure, whatever, you can know it. There's no secret in it. In general, uh, the P and the G part are uh, uh, prime and uh, root modulo, modulo uh, uh, primitive root modulo P. Uh, the primitive root modulo P is a very special number. I'll kind of give you an example of uh, how that one works, and it works with almost any number. Uh, so if I say uh, P is 5, my primitive root of modulo 5 is 2. Because what happens, I say 2 to the power 0 equals 1 modulo 5 is 1. And I keep doing that, uh, so 2 to the power 2 is 4, modulo 5 is 4. 2 to the power 3 is 8, h modulo 5 is 3, 2 to the power 4 is 16, 16 modulo 5 is 1. Hey, I already have 1. And if you continue that loop, that, that short order of those numbers will repeat. And that's the uh, root, primitive root modulo 5. Now, A and B are just random numbers. So yeah, that's it. Just the same example with, uh, with some numbers. I say 23 and 9. We select our private key, just some plain random numbers. I'm going to calculate that one. 
So here you see uh, that Alice uh, here has six, and Bob has 16. So they send that to each other. Yeah, so, so these numbers, this, this is exchanged here. And they kind of calculate the other parts, and you see, I mean, actually, when you do the numbers, it comes to nine. Thing again is, when you actually do it, those numbers are huge. And uh, the mathematical proof, and that, that's the good part about Diffie-Hellman. There's actually a mathematical proof that it works, and this, that, that, that is this formula. Of course, you can uh, you, you can change the powers and, and things like that, and still the, the the sum is still the same. Okay, well, that's a good thing. But it, it's not really good enough. Because that's why currently, if you look into certificates and, and how things are calculated in, the, in it, in general, it's elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman. So if you see somewhere in your algorithm ECDH, it's elliptic curve uh, Diffie-Hellman. Um, if you want to understand how the, this works in detail, go into net, internet, type in elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman, take the first link, you get a white paper This is about this big that will give you some mathematical proof that it works. And I tried reading it, and I fell asleep at page five. And then I started again, and I was totally flabbergasted by page eight. But the trick is, in, in essence, that if you have a elli elliptic curve, that, that this is this, this form, and so it's uh, uh, y squared uh, plus, uh, equals uh, x squared, cubed plus ax plus, uh, plus b gives a curve which has a similar form. It's always something like this. And you can pick out a point on that curve and calculate the yeah, tension, they call it, to that line. And then you end up at another point on that curve. If you go down, straight down from that one, you get at another point at, uh, on, on the graph. And for magic reasons, read that thick paper, it comes at two times that point. And you can keep continuing doing that, because if you're here and you take that line again, go down again, you're at four. And you keep, can keep on going in circles on that one. And once you've done that with a large enough number, try and figure out what this one was. It's, it's, it's undoable. Most commonly used curve is uh, 25519. Uh, you will see that in certificates uh, quite, quite, uh, quite a lot as well. There are a few of variations on it. Google uses a different one. Cloudflare has a different one. This one is used uh, by, uh, yeah, I'll get back to that one. I'm, I'm lost, I lost that one. But, yeah, it's just, it's just a number here. I don't know how they figure that one out. They say, say it's safe, and there's no real proof on why this number is a good one. This is the Diffie-Hellman exchange. And actually, it's more or less the same what I showed you for, uh, for Diffie-Hellman, the, yeah, the, the standard Diffie-Hellman exchange. And the only thing that you exchange here is the G. It's the point. And you have a random number again, where you multiply that. And when at the end you can see here, uh, A times B times G is, is the same as B times A times G. So you still have the same key. But why did we make the exchange of the public key so difficult with a, with a strange graph and multiplications? And it's, it's quite hard to do. It's all about the size. Because if you have a mobile phone and I want real good encryption for, for my communication to, to, towards my uh, website, my, my bank, bank account, or whatever, you want good encryption. So you actually would like to have a symmetric key size of 15,360 bits. Try to calculate that on your mobile phone. You start your phone, you go to your bank site, Oh, yes, I'm connected. 
That will take too long. That's why they uh, invented uh, the elliptic curve. Because you see that the key size with elliptic curve can go to 512 bits. Hmm, and your phone thinks, well, I can do that. So that's the only reason why they started doing uh, elliptic curve. To reduce the key size so that your mobile phone and other small devices can start a secure connection quickly without too much uh, compute, compute power. Okay, before I can continue, I, I've mentioned quite a few times a random number. And any programming language has a random package in it. Don't use it, especially when you're doing encryption, because it's not random. It should actually be a cryptographic secure random number generator. Because if you use random, you can get the same sequence anytime you want. It's fairly easy, and if you don't know the seed of the, that random generator, you can still quite quickly figure out what the seed was that that random generator started with. You just need about two or three minutes and you can find that one out. <coughs> because a lot of attacks on encryption and security are based on flaws in random numbers. The random number ain't random. Maybe some people know the uh, WEP encryption uh, for the Wi-Fi uh, about 10, 15 years ago. That was correct, because the number they used to get the initial key wasn't random. You just need, uh, I believe currently they can do in about seven or 8,000 Wi-Fi messages, they, they can figure out what your private key is for that exchange. Because the number ain't random. But it's very hard to Take a computer that is very good in repetitive stuff to do something random. Because how tell a computer to do take a random number? I don't know. Yeah, I can take the uh, clock. Is that random? No, it's not. Can I take the amount of bytes I've received from the internet, from all my internet uh, interface? Yeah, I could do that. There are all kinds of tricks that they can do it. But the coolest example I've ever found is Lava Rant. Maybe some people heard of it. I saw one knowing look. Uh, Cloudflare is using that. Uh, they have multiple uh, of those uh, within their environment. And that this one. This is their random number generator. What they actually do, they have a wall and they have this, uh, a bunch of uh, lava lights on it. And they just take a picture every couple of seconds. And they take that image in, which is just, they use that image as input for their random number generator. And because they're all, it's always moving and always changing, it's, it's quite random. And there are other things, uh, other parties do other things. I know one that has a uh, wind speed meter with a direction, and they do a multiplication in that one that seems to do, be doing quite well as well. Okay. That was fun. So it's now, now we, uh, I talked to you about how we can exchange uh, public and private keys or some, and symmetric key, keys. The next thing, okay, we need to do encryption. Most co a common used one is uh, AES, and which is actually is, is a block cipher. And what a block cipher is, is that instead of the initial example I gave you with RSA, with a single character encrypted and send it over the line, this one takes an entire block of data. In general, uh, the block sizes are 128, 192, and 256 bytes. Those are the sizes that uh, AES can work with. It uses a fixed key, and the fixed key means that I have to exchange a private key, key between the two parties. Read Diffie-Hellman uh, to exchange that one. I'm not going to explain it entirely, but what it does... Um, Initially, it, it takes the, uh, the key you have and uses a table to, to make what, what they call a round key, and that is to add something to the, the, the block of data. And then, then they start shifting and mixing the various columns. So they move it a little bit to the side, and that one goes, comes back on the other side. Uh, you, uh, that's what they say here. They, they shift it, and it comes back, and then they do 
rows they, 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 they mix. And once you're done, you've got something encrypted. If you want the information back, you go just from the bottom to the top. So this is, you can go back and forward. OK, that sounds all kind of fun. So we now we can exchange the key. We know what RSA is. Uh, we, we can do, actually do an en encrypted data uh, on a line. But what has that all has to do with certificates? Because that's what we're here for, right? If you look it up in, uh, on Wikipedia, you get this explanation. You're like, oh, man, that, that's a lot. The one part I want to point out is SSL. If you ever use SSL after this presentation, somebody who knows that you've been here can take a clue bed and give it to you, because SSL does not exist anymore. It's TLS. And when I say older, it's been deprecated about 10 years now, SSL. But a long story short, it's just an RSA key pair. That's, in, that's, that's stored within a certificate. OK, we include some other information because we need to identify who says it and, and, and whatnot. This is the technical format of a SSL certificate. Uh, the top part says, OK, we've got a certificate. Uh, there's a certificate part in it. There's an algorithm in it. And there is a signature in it. OK, I'll get back to that one. So the certificate ha it has a uh, serial number. Uh, it tells you who, who gave that one to you, uh, how long it's valid. You should always check if the certificate is still, still valid. Uh, the extensions part, which is used uh, quite heavily, and the extensions part, uh, in general, that contains the host name for which the certificate is issued. You'll probably, uh, if you go to uh, my company's website, dataworks.nl, and the extension there will be dataworks.nl. So you can actually verify, okay, this certificate was given to him. Uh, now the signature I'll get uh, later on. But the issue part is, is uh, what it's all about. Because certificates, it, it's all about trust. And the issue is somebody, you say, I trust you. You, as provider of this certificate, I trust that you are doing your job and make sure that the certificate is delivered safely to that party. So we need to trust them. And you can do intermediates. Uh, so, and you can here, you can have a, uh, a certificate on, on the bottom. And when you receive a certificate and you say, I trust you, uh, the browser might get green. Actually, what you're saying, I'm trusting that this certificate has been given by him. But how do we verify that that certificate is actually issued by that guy that I trust? Well, it's in the signature. Because the signature is created by the issuer. It can be verified by, by means of the public key of the issuer because it's an RSA, it's a public-private uh, key part. Uh, the signature is on the TBS certificate part. The signature is calculated on that part. Because if you don't do that, you can never get it back. Um, and you can extract the hash, because you're just calculating a hash value, and that's encrypted. And you can extract it and calculate it by yourself. And for that, I have a small demo with OpenSSL. If, if ever, anyone ever wants to work with OpenSSL, this is the top level help page. And each blue thingy is a new command that has sub options and things. So it's one of the most powerful tools you, you can find to uh, work with certificates. 
All right, I scripted this one because there are a few commands in that I can really, really not remember. Okay, the first thing I do here is I just connect to my company's website and I say, okay, give me the certificate. Whoa, that's quite a bit. I scroll up a little bit. And here you say, here you see that one, it's a less encrypt uh, certificate, and the common name is for dataworks.nl. I can see an entire certificate chain, so all the intermediate certificates are shown here. So this is a, uh, what, what you see here, all selected. This part is a certificate from Let's Encrypt. This is uh, one of the top levels above that one. And you, so you keep going on until you're not giving the root, but just on, on to, uh, until the root. Uh, common name, here he is a, okay, it's, a, it's SHA-65, it's the elective curve. Here you see that number again, uh, the, uh, is it readable? Where was it? The 2500-519, but that's the uh, formula I showed you earlier on. So that one is used to calculate uh, some values. Okay, cool. Next I can go uh, with, with the certificate. I say, okay, who's the issuer? We already saw it, but you can just ask with open else yourself. You say, okay, what's the issuer of this certificate? In this case, the issuer is uh, let's, let's Encrypt, which is quite, uh, and we can get the public key from my issuer. Because I'm, what I'm going to, try to do here is I'm going to verify if the certificate I received is actually the correct one, if that has been signed by my issuer. Read, let's encrypt. This is the public key that I can use to decrypt something. This is a very, very long command. This is why I scripted it, because I hope you trust me that I have problems with remembering this, this part. Uh, what you're actually doing here is you're uh, extracting the uh, signature value. That's this one. Okay, now I can take the signature and do a verification on it. It's not showing anything here yet. I can and parse, I can take the part of the, uh, the TBS part, actually the actual certificate I can take, take out of it, it's all in binary. And here you see this is the signature that is within that certificate. So it starts with E5CA something. I do something similar. And here I'm going to cal calculate the digest uh, of that one, of, of the certificate itself. And here you see the number, the number here, the uh, last number that starts, starts with E5CA. And I had that one here as well. So I calculated my own digest. And I verified that with the one that was in the message itself. And if you want to try that, Please do try and figure out what the commands are. You can, if you Google it on the internet, you can find this example with, with a lot more in, in intermediate steps. Because I just skipped uh, skipped a few, otherwise it will take uh, way too long. Okay, that was our demo. Okay. Putting it all together, because we know the certificate, we, uh, we know uh, the exchange of the keys, we know the, uh, how we do encryption, how, how we encode and, and, uh, and decode data, we know how to verify a certificate, but we still don't have a secure connection. It's just the basics of it. In comes the TLS handshake. TLS handshake is the part that actually set up, sets up the uh, secure connection that is encrypted. Step one, 
the client sends a hello to the server it wants to connect to, and it sends the cipher suites that it support, supports. I just given two. Actually, there, there are four on TLS 1.3, but these are the only ones that are allowed. And you see here, it's AAS with 128 bytes, uh, SHA-256 on, on verification parts. Uh, these are the ones that are there. So, and they send the initial part of the key share. So in the elliptic curve, you take the point, multiply it with your own random number, that one is sent as well. And it sends the certificate, which is very important. The server then says, well, okay, I'm gonna use this cipher, cipher suite, I'm gonna send my own part of the uh, shared key. Maybe I, 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 can, I can send my signed certificate uh, as well. And then it says signed finish. All the communication that has been done before that one, all the data that has been sent will be signed with the public key of the server. Oh, sorry, with the private key of the server so the client can verify, yes, all the communication that we already done, we both received the same things. And the last day, yeah, you're going to verify the certificate, you're going to verify the signature, and from that point on, you have a secure connection. And now you know all about certificates. All the basics. Because uh, I've given you a, a, a quite a high-level overview on things that are taking place uh, during the uh, certificate exchange and, and the encryption parts that are in it. But there's a lot more to it, especially when you dive a little bit deeper into how does AES works. Uh, if, if you dive in, you can actually see it's quite elegant, the solution that they come up with. And it was from our uh, Belgium neighbors, they, uh, they invented that one. Mm -hmm.